This is a revision video for AQA GCSE Biology. These are purely factual recall questions covering Unit 6, which is the Inheritance, Variation and Evolution topic. There's a separate video that covers all of the combined science content, which is why this one starts at question 67. But if you're taking GCSE Biology, which you might call triple science, then you should also be able to recall all of the material covered in this video. There's a link in the description below to a worksheet that contains all 92 questions, so you can work through these and then use this video to check your answers. The first topic in Unit 6 that has some content that only comes up in the GCSE Biology exams is sexual and asexual reproduction. While you need to know about the differences between these methods of reproduction for the combined science exams, for GCSE Biology you also need to be able to describe why using each method of reproduction might give you an advantage. The first thing you need to know is that sexual reproduction produces variation in the offspring. In other words, not all of the offspring are clones of each other, there are differences between them. This is particularly important if you're living in an environment where the conditions are liable to change. As the environment changes around you, the variation is going to mean that some organisms have an advantage over others. So if you're producing lots of offspring and you don't know what the environment is going to be like, it's an advantage to reproduce sexually because there's a good chance that at least one of your offspring will be very well adapted to that new environment. Also, and it's debatable whether we would really count this as an advantage, but AQA say it is, it's only possible for evolution to happen by natural selection where there's variation in a population. So particularly if we're thinking about humans trying to carry out selective breeding, we can only do that with organisms that can reproduce sexually, because without that there wouldn't be variation in offspring, and so we wouldn't be able to pick out the organisms that had the most desirable traits. On the flip side, asexual reproduction only requires one parent. This is particularly important if you're trying to colonise a new area. Say, for instance, that an animal has migrated further north in its range than any other individual of that species. If it can reproduce asexually, then it can colonise the new area, whereas if it needs to wait for a mate, then it won't be able to do so. Even if there are mates available, being able to reproduce asexually is going to be more time and energy efficient because you're not having to wait around for a mate that's available. In contrast to sexual reproduction, which is really useful when the environment is changing, Asexual reproduction is a good way to go when the environment around you is static and you are already being really successful in it. If you know that you're successful in your environment and it's unlikely to change, then clones of you would also be successful. Also, even when we don't take into consideration the time taken to find a mate, asexual reproduction is often faster than sexual reproduction. Although most of the organisms you can think of reproduce either sexually or asexually, there are plenty of examples of organisms that can employ both strategies and choose which one is most appropriate to their current situation. There are four examples listed in the specification, starting with strawberry plants. These can produce flowers in order to reproduce sexually when they want to introduce variation to their offspring, or they can produce runners, a bit like a spider plant, and these allow them to reproduce asexually. Daffodils are another example of a plant that can choose either strategy. They can produce flowers to reproduce sexually, or they can produce bulbs which allow them to produce clones. The parasite that causes malaria reproduces asexually within its human host, but when it's in its mosquito host, it produces sexually. And then finally, fungi are also able to reproduce in either way. Their spores allow them to reproduce asexually, but they're also able to undergo sexual reproduction. A DNA nucleotide has three key parts. At the centre of the nucleotide is a pentose sugar, in other words, a sugar that has five carbons in it. This is attached to a phosphate group, which makes up the backbone of the DNA. Attached to this is also a nitrogenous base. It's these bases that provide the code for the DNA. There are four bases that you need to know about. Adenine pairs with thymine, and cytosine pairs with guanine. Although for the GCSE exams, you are allowed to just use the single letter codes. A and T go together, and C and G go together. When we say that DNA codes for an amino acid, what we mean is that those nitrogenous bases come in groups of threes called codons. And it's possible for each one of those three letter codes to represent an amino acid. The first step in protein synthesis is something called transcription, 
In transcription, the DNA sequence of the gene of interest is copied to make a new smaller molecule called messenger RNA. RNA is another type of nucleic acid. Because it's a much smaller molecule, it's able to leave the nucleus and go out into the cytoplasm. Once there, it interacts with the ribosomes. Remember, the DNA is made up of triplet codons, each made of three bases. The ribosomes are able to translate this code using another molecule called a transfer RNA. Each transfer RNA has one particular amino acid attached. And so by lining up according to the codes of the codons, it's possible for the transfer RNAs to bring all of the right amino acids in the right order. And these are then bonded together to make a peptide, which can then be folded to make a protein. Where a mutation occurs in a DNA sequence, there are four possible things that can happen. The first one is, well, nothing. There may be no change. This could happen for two main reasons. One would be if the sequence of DNA that's changed isn't actually in a coding region. In other words, it wasn't coding for a protein in the first place. The other reason is because there are 64 possible triplet codons, but only 20 key amino acids. And that means that many of those amino acids have more than one codon that codes for them. So it's possible that the mutation may have changed the sequence of the DNA, but the new DNA sequence still codes for the same amino acid. The second thing that can happen is that while the protein may be the same, its expression pattern may change. This means it may be being made more or less than it was before. And this tends to happen when the mutation lies in what we call a promoter region. This is a little piece of DNA, usually at the start of the gene, which tells the cell how much of that protein to make. The third thing that can happen is that the sequence of the protein can be changed so much that the protein is damaged beyond repair. And this is called a knockout mutation. It means that there won't be any functioning version of that protein being produced. The final thing, and the thing that tends to lead to evolution, but is also incredibly rare, is that there's actually a change of structure where the protein is still functional and it still works, but no longer in the same way that it did before. The four types of cloning that we learn about in GCSE biology are cuttings, tissue culture, embryo transplant cloning, and adult cell cloning. Tissue culture is carried out when small groups of cells are grown either in a growth medium or on petri dishes. The advantage of this is that it produces lots of identical plants. This is particularly important when trying to preserve rare plant species, but it's also done commercially in nurseries. In order to take a cutting of a plant, you need to remove a small section, but it's important that that small section includes a meristem. As we know, meristems are sources of stem cells. That cutting is then placed in rooting powder before being planted. Slightly confusingly, the first step in embryo transplant cloning is actually sexual reproduction. This could happen naturally, but more commonly it will happen in a lab in a petri dish. Once an embryo has been produced, when it starts dividing and is at maybe the 8 or 16 cell stage, those will be split apart into individual embryos. In other words, we're creating artificial twins. Each one of those embryos is then put separately into the uterus of a different host mother. This then means that you'll have a herd of identical offspring being produced. So these offspring are all identical to one another, but they only share 50% of their DNA with their mother, just the same as a normal sexually reproduced offspring. Adult cell cloning is our typical dolly the sheep cloning. The first step is that you take an egg cell and you remove the nucleus from it. This is sometimes called enucleating the egg cell. Then you take a body cell or a somatic cell from the organism that you actually want to clone and you remove the nucleus from that and put it into the egg cell. Then we use an electric shock in order to start that cell dividing. Once the cell is dividing and has produced an embryo, that embryo is transferred to the uterus of a host mother. She will carry the pregnancy to term and give birth to the cloned animal. So when we think about the three different parents, for want of a better word, the offspring will be genetically identical to the somatic cell donor, but they won't share any DNA at all with the egg cell donor or the host mother.
The start of Charles Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection was the observations that he made while travelling on HMS Beagle and around the world expedition. This was backed up by years of experimentation and discussion with other scientists, but was also supported by developing knowledge of geology and fossils. The three key ideas in the theory of evolution by natural selection are firstly that there is variation in populations, so not every individual is identical to every other individual. Based on this, some individuals are going to have a selective advantage. This is going to mean that they are more likely to survive and, crucially, to breed. When they do, their characteristics are then passed on to the next generation. Darwin published his findings in a book called On the Origin of Species, which was published in 1859. Initially, many people were slow to accept his conclusions, and this was for a number of reasons. Firstly, his ideas contradicted the idea that God had made all of the animals and plants that live on Earth in exactly the form in which we currently find them. But it wasn't just this. It was also the fact that he lacked evidence to back up his ideas, and so he was kind of just asking people to trust him on faith. Also, the mechanism of inheritance and variation wasn't known about until 50 years after the theory was published. This meant that even though he could explain what he thought was happening, he couldn't say why it was happening and how it was happening. Jean-Baptiste Lamarck proposed a theory of evolution called the theory of use and disuse. This basically said that if you used a body part a lot in your lifetime, then your offspring would then be born with that body part having been enlarged. This was relatively straightforward to disprove because you could just amputate body parts and then see that that organism's offspring weren't born with them having been made smaller. We now know that in the vast majority of cases, the theory of use and disuse doesn't explain how evolution happens. Alfred Wallace independently proposed the theory of evolution by natural selection. He's also famous due to the work he did about the evolution of warning coloration. Also, he did a lot of writing about speciation and how this happens. Gregor Mendel is famous for carrying out early breeding experiments using pea plants, which led to the development of early genetic theory. Although we now call these genes, he used the name units. It wasn't until the late 19th century that we were able to observe chromosomes during cell division, and the structure of DNA wasn't established until the mid 20th century. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you found this useful as you start revising Unit 6 of AQA GCSE Biology. Don't forget to also watch the video that contains all of the combined science content for this unit. If you do find these videos useful then don't forget to like and subscribe for more GCSE Biology content coming soon.